You know, we had so much fun recently at CPAC in Texas, and this is the in third installment of our many interviews. You know, we got to talk to so many police supporters, law enforcement leaders, uh, political candidates who are pro-law enforcement, pro-American justice system candidates, and we have been so honored to share them with you. You know, this is the thing I want everyone to think about uh, as an American voter. You know, the National Police Association, we are not a political organization. We are not a police union. We are an organization for you, the American public, to learn more about how you can support law enforcement, local, state, federal, because now more than ever, American law enforcement needs your support. And that includes at the ballot box. So we're not gonna ask you to make a decision based on our views. What we want you to do is look at, is look at your candidates, local, state, federal, and look to see who supports American law enforcement, who supports not criminals, but crime victims and law and order in your area. And that's what we did at CPAC Texas is we had the chance to talk to so many people who support us. So take a look at some of these candidates that we spoke to. And then you know what? Let us know what you think. Hey, here we are at CPAC Texas. I'm Sergeant Betsy Brantner Smith with the National Police Association, and I'm so excited to talk to a young man who has decided to run for office because what he is seeing in his native Texas, uh, specifically in the Dallas area. Brandon Copeland, welcome to the program. Thank you, Betsy. I'm so, really excited to be here. Absolutely. So, uh, tell me why, at your age, you decide to run for office, get involved in politics. Absolutely, it's a great question. Uh, I think like most folks, um, you know, in our country and especially in red states, we're very frustrated with a lot of the overreach that we've been seeing happen um, and not just overreach, but unconstitutional overreach. Um, and I've always been passionate about politics. Um, you know, I wanted to run for office at some point in my life, but I definitely did never expected to be doing it this early. Um, you know, I studied engineering in college, but uh, the opportunity presented itself um, and I thought that I needed to step up because no one else did. I was actually the only one that stepped up to run in my district. So what kind of things are you seeing in your in your district when it comes to the, you know, we have a crime problem in this country. Absolutely. What are you seeing specifically in your district? Well, we've seen uh, an increase in violent crimes. We've seen an increase uh, in drugs uh, in our communities, and we've seen an increase in, an increasing homeless problem. Uh, more and more people, you know, you can see them camped out on the streets, uh, you know, they're pitching up tents. It's starting to look like San Francisco, and that's not okay. You know, these, these people, they need help. Um, but there's also a lot of problems that come with that. Um, like I mentioned, violent crimes are up. Mm -hmm. I think almost over 200% uh, now in Dallas County. So uh, it's a real issue, and people don't feel safe walking home at night. And that is, you know, people who don't feel safe aren't truly free. And, and, you know, the, the government has a role in public safety. You know, we don't, we don't like just what you said. We don't like government overreach. But government, you know, and specifically law enforcement, has a role in public safety. So do our politicians. You know, what do you, how do you think you can affect that issue in your district? Well, we have to have our police know that we support them and we back them. You know, they need to feel like we're behind and we got their backs, you know, and that they can do their job and not have to worry about, you know, accidentally making a mistake and then having their life be ruined by, you know, any sort of, because we're all imperfect and we all make mistakes and we have lots of really incredible uh, police officers that have retired and stepped down um, because of this really toxic environment that we're now in. Um, and you see it a lot being pushed from the, from the radical left um, attacking our police officers and, um, you know, making them out to be villainous, um, which mm -hmm. is just totally incorrect. These are people that deeply care about our communities. They uh, generally want to protect and serve, which is why they stepped into that role in the first place. Um, so they have good hearts and um, 
you know, some of our best police um, are stepping down. It's hard also to recruit police. We have a huge gap um, uh, with the number of police that we have and how many we actually need. Um, and there's lots of open, uh, you know, positions there. Yeah, absolutely. And we just can't find people to fill those roles anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's not as many applicants and people that are looking to get involved in that uh, you, in policing. You are absolutely correct. Now, Texas and the border, yeah. you know, that's always a big conversation. Absolutely. And, and you're up here in Dallas County. How does the border affect the people of your district, this open, porous border? How does that affect your constituents? Yeah, well, not just my constituents, but um, all, of, all of Texas, mm -hmm. um, but especially my constituents, uh, being in a more urban area, um, you know, with the border being so porous, um, you know, we've seen people come across and we've seen drugs uh, pour across our border. Fentanyl's up over 400%, you know, since Biden took office. Um, and what is the result of that? The result is you, we're seeing uh, more crime taking place. Mm -hmm. We're seeing people um, brazenly um, go and, and steal things from stores. And um, we have a DA that won't prosecute uh, you know, a lot of these criminals that are stealing, uh, you know, up to, I think he said up to $750, uh, $750, $750, mm -hmm. you won't prosecute. Um, and so people just go and steal from these small businesses. It's very damaging. It's damaging yeah. to the economy. Um, and it's also damaging to our schools, right? With drugs coming in and people don't feel safe. It's hard to have effective school systems yeah. um, that are truly educating our kids. Um, and so it really does permeate into every issue I believe uh, that we're facing it affects everything. Uh, it affects our economy, it affects our schools, all the important things, and it certainly affects uh, you know our our ability to just live our lives how we want, and it affects our liberty. Because when I don't certainly don't feel safe walking around at night, uh, I live right in the heart of Dallas, I live mm -hmm. in Uptown, mm -hmm. um, and so you know when it's at night, you need to be um, you know either carrying you know or you need to be with a group of people. Um, you know, and ensure that you can be safe. Right. Um, and that's right. really the only way to, to do it. I mean, certainly can't be walking by yourself. And on the that issue of uh, carrying a firearm, mm -hmm. um, lastly, let's talk about the Second Amendment. Yep. You know, the National Police Association, we absolutely support armed, trained citizens and our right to carry. Um, what's your feelings about constitutional carry mm -hmm. and the Second Amendment in general? Well, the Second Amendment is very clear. You know, it says the right shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed is very clear language, right? And that's something that, um, you know, the, the Democrats right now um, don't really want to think about or they don't even care about it, frankly. Um, I mean, we've seen it, they said it openly. They want to get rid of the Second Amendment. They want to tear down those rights. They want to restrict those rights, um, which all of those things that they're saying is unconstitutional. It actually violates their oath that they swore when they took office. Um, which is a, obviously a huge problem. Um, but also, you know, and especially in living in an urban area, you know, I think it's necessary. We need the Second Amendment to protect ourselves, especially when, um, you know, we can't always re rely on the police, and the police are incredible. You know, they respond when, um, when necessary. But, you know, some crises happen in 30 seconds, 15 seconds. But guess what? The police can't respond in 15 seconds unless they're standing right there. Exactly. You know, there is a response time. And within that, you've got to be able to protect yourself. Um, and so we need to defend and protect our right um, and our Second Amendment, um, especially right now when it's so under fire from the left. And, you know, I say it, uh, officers, we are one Senate seat away in the federal government from losing that right. Um, you know, if it wasn't for Joe Manchin protecting the filibuster, the left would have packed the courts. Yep. And with that, they would have packed the courts, not with justices that would be um, interpreting law, but justices that would be essentially legislating from the bench. Mm -hmm. And they would be trampling our rights. They've said that that's what they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people go to find out more about you, your campaign, absolutely. and perhaps contribute? Yeah, well, you can go to my website, copelandfortexas.com, uh, or you can find me on social media. I'm at Real Copeland on Twitter. I'm at Brandon Copeland uh, TX on Instagram, and Copeland for Texas on Facebook. You know, I got to tell you, Brandon Copeland was one of the highlights for me of the CPAC conference. He's such an accomplished and articulate young man. He has such a fantastic grasp of the issues, and he truly wants to serve his community. Now, my next guest is a politician 
but he's really a business owner here in uh, Arizona. And I appreciate so much what he had to say uh, about law enforcement and about why he decided to get in, uh, involved in politics. So next, I want you to meet a uh, business owner, restaurateur, and now candidate. <laughs> hey, we are here at day two CPAC, Texas. And I am so excited to talk to a local politician who really cares about law enforcement issues in my state of Arizona. Kelly Cooper is with me running for Congress in CD4. Yes. And we have been talking about some of the difficult issues that we have in Arizona because our law enforcement officers are being vilified. Mm -hmm. They're being defunded in some areas and they're just beleaguered and they're trying to do all the right things, yep. but they're not necessarily getting the support, especially politically, that they should be. What are you gonna do about that? Well, I think uh, from a federal perspective, I wanna be able to push on making sure that the federal government stays out of local policing. They have no business being there. Uh, and I think, you know, to your point, a lot of what I'm seeing right now is really just about demoralizing police um, all around the country, but in our, our area specifically. It's one of those things that we really, really have to get out front of because I don't think anybody takes a job uh, to do a bad job at it. Everybody that takes a job really wants to be good at it. And it used to be that when I grew up, people grew up want, were saying, when I grow up, I wanna be a police officer. When I grow up, I wanna be a fireman. And I feel like that's not really happening today. We, we have to put that pride back. We have to give that pride back. Because I think that all police have that. I think they have a, an internal pride in the job that they do, but our society and our culture has tried to take it away. And we have to reinstill that if we want to get back to law and order. And that's one of the things that you as a Marine, you really understand that sense of mission and that oh. pride in what you do. And American law enforcement, one of the reasons we're having such a difficult time, Phoenix PD is a good example, mm -hmm. of retaining and recruiting yep police officers is because, like we talked about, if you can't take pride in your work and, it, and if you don't feel that sense of mission that what you does, uh, what you do matters, you're going to go do something else for a living, maybe leave the profession, right? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think we talked about this earlier, but if I took a job and I did my job all day, I worked very, very hard, and then I woke up the next morning and somebody came behind and undid all of my work, why would I ever want to get up and do that job? So you have, you know, the defund movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. You've got uh, attorney generals that are undoing the work that's being, the hard work that's being done, the prideful work that's being done for the benefit of our community. It's all being undone. Why, again, why would anybody do that job? I, it, it's one of those things that, that as a society, as a culture, we have to have. And we've spent so much time talking about the exception, demonizing the exception as if it's the whole, that we've treated the whole as if it's a demon. And it's time to come back from that. It's time to treat our law enforcement, the people that make sure we have law and order, with the respect that they deserve. I served in the Marines. I served all over the world in, in many different countries. And if, if I, I'm already away from my family, I'm already risking my life, I'm already concerned about all of those things. And if I'm doing all those things for somebody that doesn't care, that I'm putting that much effort in, why would I do it anymore? Why, why would I ever get up and do that? I can go do something else. And that is so well said. And in our state of Arizona, one of our biggest law enforcement issues, and plus a bigger issue for all of us who live there, is the border. <laughs> so, you know, talk about, you know, how does the border affect the Phoenix suburban area, and how does the border affect our state? Oh, it's massive. So we can we talk about it from both uh, an economic perspective. Let's talk about it from the policing perspective. You are already in an environment where we cannot find enough officers to fill the roles that we need. We are in an environment where the Biden administration is encu has encouraged um, migrants to come across the border. Said, "You're welcome. Please come." And border security, border patrol doesn't have enough units to be able to handle that influx. So what happens is they become the administrative where they're handling processing people and the, the Biden administration is continuing that process. While there's drug runners and traffickers coming across the border 
wreaking havoc in our suburbs and in our communities. We're talking about running drugs, we're talking about um, the coyotes that are running uh, cars loaded down with people, and you have police that are already limited in the amount and being overworked in overtime, that now not only have to have the job of policing their community, but policing their community with an influx of people that shouldn't be there in the first place. Again, it's the administration is really hamstringing law and order in this, in this country through the southern border and through the way that we treat our police. And when we talk about the treatment of law enforcement, you know, the Biden administration uh, is still going to punish the Border Patrol agents involved in the Ugh. Haitian whipping case. The National Police Association decided to get involved in that. Right. And we have filed a FOIA lawsuit to make sure that we have all the communications about that case because, you know, the Border Patrol agents have been found that they did nothing right. wrong when it comes to whipping Haitian migrants, but they're going to be punished for weird administrative rule violations. And it's, it's so incredibly frustrating because, again, it goes back to that sense of mission and and border patrol agents in arizona they're also our citizens our residents they're the people in our they're our communities. family absolutely and so it is incredibly frustrating and I, I know a big fear for us is we're not going to have enough law enforcement to do the job of not just the border in arizona but the influx in fentanyl mm -hmm. the human trafficking and then just the day-to-day -day crime and crime prevention right. in an area like the Phoenix metro area. Right, and and a lot of people, when I first moved to Phoenix, and this has been a long time, um, people called it the kidnap capital of the world. Yeah. And you have an environment where you're restricting the amount of people that can enforce the laws that can protect the people, and then you have an increasing negative effect on rising crime, and then you wonder why the police are, are I won't say ineffective because the ones that are working, the ones that we can find to do the job are doing the best job they can with what they have, but it's not enough to cover what the need is. We have to, as a society, as a community, get back to talking about the, the pride, the goodwill, the hard work that the police do for us. And then we need to take the exception out back and whip, whip them, right? <laughs> exactly. Because you got, you got border patrol that's, they're using their reins to guide their horses and being Acted, acted as if they've been whipping people. And instead of recognizing the fault in, in the prejudgment of that and saying, hey, that's our fault. Um, you know, here's some reward for us being so abusive and mean to you. We're gonna go ahead and punish them. It is like backwards land. It's like upside down world. And, and it, it, there is no sign of it getting better until we have good politicians in office that are going to fight for it getting better. And that's, that's where I come in. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, last thing, you know, Arizona is a constitutional carry state. Mm -hmm. And as a Marine, you know, you're very familiar with firearms. And, and there's lots of talk, uh, especially from the Biden administration and Democrats, on uh, gun control and eroding the Second Amendment. Talk about that for a minute for the state of Arizona. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm rated AQ from the NRA. I'm endorsed by the Gun Owners of America. I am a Marine that's world traveled and I have a biometric safe in my house with many, many long guns, and many, many handguns. And the Second Amendment is written for what's happened in Ukraine. It's written so that you can defend yourself both from foreign, but also domestic tyranny, from people coming into your, your area and affecting your personal property. It's not about hunting. It's not about anything else. The Second Amendment is the right for you to defend yourself from, God forbid, anything but the tyranny of your own government was the number one priority. And if you know the time that this was going on, it was about the tyranny of the British government coming into the colonies. So we don't get to reframe how these amendments were written. They were written for a certain reason. And that's, I th that's where I'm at with it. That's outstanding. Kelly Cooper, where can people find more about you, your candidacy, and yes, your restaurant? Sure, <laughs> sure. So I have three restaurants in the district, two melting pot restaurants, and my own independent concept called BKD's Backyard Joint. You can find that in Chandler at Pecos and McQueen. i uh, love for you to come check out the restaurants because we do a lot of great work there. For my campaign, you can find me at kellycooperarizona.com. And if you're in the district, um, or even in the state of Arizona, we need all the volunteers, all the support that we can get to make sure we flip this seat red. If you're not, um, or even if you are, uh, contributions matter. 
And I call them contributions because you're not donating to a cause, you're contributing to a movement. So please go visit me there. Absolutely, I can't wait to have a beer at your place. Yeah, absolutely. And if you'd like more information about us at the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. That concludes the third installment of our special National Police Association at CPAC, Texas. I hope you enjoyed these interviews and these leaders as much as we enjoyed bringing them to you. You know, American law enforcement should not be a political issue. As law enforcement officers, we take an oath to uphold the constitution of our state and our nation and to best support and protect people of all walks of life, regardless of their politics or their race, gender, sexual orientation, you name it. There is no one more neutral than the American law enforcement officer, because what we want is the protection and the safety of all our citizens, of everyone in our community. But unfortunately, American law enforcement has become a political issue. So we are going to continue to talk to people on both sides of the aisle about supporting the American criminal justice system and the American law enforcement officer, because that is the way that we are going to make our communities better and you, the American public, safer. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.